Hi, this is Drew Tignanelli. We're here talking about retirement with Graham Ewing. I love your haircut. Thank you. Same with you. I think this should be our intro every time. <laughs> anyway, what are we doing today, Graham? Today, a great seminar. We've, we've got a great seminar lined up here. We've got 10 things to do before retirement. A lot of our clients are either ones who are about to retire or have recently retired. So this is a really important topic for a lot of people. Yeah, and we're doing more on the surface, right? We're not going to go into great depth on everything. Right. We want to hit these points and say, you know, you need to be thinking about all these things. It's about knowing what you don't know. Right. You don't have to know every little aspect. It's knowing what you don't know. Right. That's what we're covering today. Yeah. So we've got 10 categories, 10 things That's that we're going to go through. Ten Again, ten. this is like Jeopardy. I think we did that last time. So... Here we go. Number one, know your annual spending number. We're going to dive deeper into these, but I want to give you a preview of, of the slides here. So know your annual spending number, Social Security, analyze your pension options, your portfolio income plan. How are you going to take money from, from your portfolio, from your savings? And then how are you going to invest that through retirement, through the transition of retirement, and then you know once you are retired? Have a tax plan. Health insurance plan. That's a big one. A lot of people have questions about that. And updating your estate plan. Think about long-term care insurance. Notice I said think about. And then the last one, which is arguably the most important, are those non-financial aspects. We're going to dive deeper into that. So number one, a little cut off there. Move this down. So know your annual spending number. This is really of, from a financial standpoint, the most important thing about retirement. And there's really two ways that you could do this. It's, in my opinion, it's the most important thing of all financial planning. Well, there's the, yes, financial planning. That non-financial aspect is pretty important that we'll talk about as well. But financially, yes, the best way to do this is to track your cash flow. Yeah. So you've got tools like mint.com. The easiest way, if people don't do that, is annualize your net pay from your pay stub. So if you make $4,000 per pay and you get paid 26 times per year, it's $104,000. Now, there's other things you have to factor in. If you've got a lot of credit card debt, that means you were spending above what you made. If you had savings from another source besides your income, again, you have to factor those in as well. So why don't you tell them, what, what have you done to, to track this? They think you've got a record here. Oh yeah, I can I can go back to 1992 and tell you every nickel I've spent. I use Quicken, right? And uh, um, but you know it's really disappointing how few people actually do track their cash flow, and yet it is the most important thing. Um, well, and I think it's it's clear to distinguish budgeting versus tracking cash flow. So absolutely. budgeting is is like having a diet, right? Right. A cash flow is just saying, all right, I'm going to step on the scale. And see what happened. Where did my money go? Right. And it's not a it's not something that's meant to be super restrictive. It's just meant to say, hey, I made X amount of money. Where did it go last month? And is am I okay with that? Yeah. And and where did it go? You know, right. and so forth. But yeah, you need to know so that you can do the retirement planning, one way or the other. Exactly. Yep. So number two, social security. This is a big, big topic for a lot of retirees. The first step you want to do is download your social security statement. You go to ssa.gov, create an account, download the statement. A lot of people have done that, but if you haven't, get on there, download that statement. The biggest thing about social security, Drew, right? It's based on life expectancy. Tell me when you're gonna die, I'll tell you when to take We would security. know the exact day to collect social <laughs> security, right? But because we don't know that, we've got to factor in you know, health, family hit situation, things like that. and uh, the, the thing to remember, you know, one thing to remember about Social Security is that beyond just life expectancy, it's not just your own life expectancy if you're married. It's that joint life expectancy. So if you are the higher earner and you have that higher benefit, whether you pass away first or second, that benefit of yours that's higher than your spouse's will continue. Whereas your spouse's, if that is the lower benefit amount, the first one of you to pass away, that amount, the lower amount, will go away. Correct. So we have to think about when we look at that break even, it's the joint and then the first 
want to pass away. Right. Also keep in mind that this is a lot more complicated if you were divorced right. and had been married more than 10 years, or if you, you were married and your spouse passed away and you didn't get remarried before the age of 60. There's lots of little components to this, but that's the basic that you've laid out there. Yes. And it's what you need to understand. But if you have some of these other complications, we need to talk about it. Right. Right. A lot more, lot more complexity than what's just on this slide. So number three, some people have a pension still, especially if you're working for the government. You know, you've been working at a, an employer for a long time. Sometimes you'll still be eligible for that. And the two big questions you're asking here is what age do I collect and what survivor benefit option do I choose? So when we talk about the options, right, you look at that statement, you'll see there's maybe even one option that says lump sum. So instead of taking a monthly amount, they're giving you $500,000. And then on the other end of that spectrum, you've got one that says, I'm going to take a monthly amount. And if I pass away, it goes away. My spouse doesn't get anything. It's called a single life annuity. And then there's others that say, I want 100% survivor option, where you might take a little bit less per month that you could have received otherwise, but that benefit will continue for your surviving spouse. Right. And, you know, a lot of people with this pension option, they have a bias, right? They're either biased toward, you know, some significant conservative uh, survivor option, right? Or they're biased toward taking lump sums of cash or, you know, taking the maximum amount of money. And that is the worst way to make the decision. It really needs to be talked out right. and analyzed each and every different aspect and which one's really going to work best for you. Well, and the, and the thing we haven't talked about yet is how connected all of these things are. Oh, right? absolutely. So you got Social Security, you've got your pension, you've got your savings. All of them really have to be factoring in the others to make the best decision. Yeah. So speaking of that, that other... Uh, that other component here is the portfolio. So you've saved up your whole life. How should you take money out to live? How much should you take? So really, you know, I'm putting in a pretty simple calculation on here, but let's say that annual spending number was $150,000. Let's say you have social security of $40,000 and your pension is $30,000. Again, keeping it simple, just means we need to take out about $80,000 from the portfolio. Obviously, there's inflation, $80,000 at the beginning of retirement. It's different than $80,000 at the end. But just for the purpose of this exercise, this is one way to really to look at it. So then when you think about, OK, I need $80,000, you have to ask yourself, well, how should I have that money invested? You don't just go all the cash when you retire. That's not the finish line. The analogy I've heard out there, a metaphor, is that retirement's like a mountain, right? You saving, you've climbed to the top of the mountain. You've made it. You're at the peak. It's a beautiful view. But you still have to climb down. And sometimes the muscles you use climbing down a mountain are more strenuous than climbing up. So let's say you have a $2 million portfolio. Scenario one, you need $80,000 like we talked about. That's 4% of a $2 million portfolio. So making it crystal clear, these numbers are not any kinds of guarantees or anything like that. It's just an exercise. But the 4%, let's say you could be in a moderate portfolio earning 4%. You don't need to be too aggressive or too conservative, but you have to have something in there to get that 4% rate of return. Scenario two, let's say you're track, you, you were tracking your cash flow and you actually need to pull out uh, only $60,000. If you only need 3%, you could actually be in a, in a more conservative portfolio than if you needed 80,000. Um, and then third scenario, got, got it blocked there a little bit. Third scenario is, let's on the, on the other end, let's say you needed $100,000, 5%. If, there, if you need that higher withdrawal rate, you might need a higher uh, aggressiveness in the portfolio as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, when when people my age or older 
think of this, Graham. They always think that the interest and dividends is what they're going to live off of. Right. But in today's world, you now think of total return. Right. That's the interest, the dividends, and the growth of the portfolio. And you're just doing an annual withdrawal on the lump sum. That's the way you think about it nowadays. Right. Don't try to think that you're ever going to generate a portfolio that's just going to pump out interest and dividends. Dividend, right. Because uh, it doesn't always work in today's world. Right. We've had we've had clients who, you know, bought Apple many years ago. And Apple, you know, historically hadn't really paid a dividend. They know they do now. But if you were only going to get income from Apple's dividend, not going to work, right? <laughs> but if you look at the stock, the, the price appreciation of that stock, you likely would have more than enough of a return. And yes, you might have to sell some stock to raise the cash for, for this withdrawal, but that's, that's we're how talking it works. total return. You total know, return. It's, it's the growth plus the interest in dividends. You just draw a portion off each year and you monitor it every right. every six months or a year. Every single year. Right. So the, the point of this slide is you have to think about what's my financial need for my portfolio, which will dictate really how aggressive you need to be. But you also have to consider that comfort side or that psychological side of, hey, if I'm in a more aggressive portfolio and we experience a market like we did in 2022, am I going to stick with that plan? Because if you're not, we're in trouble. That that you, Both of those sides have to work, the psychological side and the financial side. Yep. Absolutely. So number six, one of our favorite topics, taxes. So there's different types of accounts and they're taxed differently. So we've got a taxable brokerage account. That's where you've got dividends, interest, capital gains ta taxed on that. Traditional IRAs, that's pre-tax money. So every dollar that you take out is taxable, shows up on your tax return. And a Roth IRA, it's the exact opposite. You already paid the tax on that money. So every dollar you take out, assuming it's a qualified distribution, and we won't get into the details of that, but most of the time it's tax-free when you take money out of a Roth IRA. So we have to think, what's, what's the combination of withdrawal from each of those types of accounts? And what I want to go through here is that when people retire, if you look at the timeline, they have different opportunities and different challenges at each of those stages. So at age 63, let's say you retire, you no longer have a salary. You might have Social Security, you might have pension, something, but let's just say no longer salary. So your income has dropped. You might have a really good uh, time frame from a tax perspective to take money from pre-tax accounts at that point because you uh, you have no other income. So you're in those first few brackets possibly. Age 65, that's where Medicare generally starts for people. And there's this thing called IRMA that it's, I think it stands for Income Related Medicare Monthly Adjustment. And true. basically it says that if you're over a certain income, you will pay more in Medicare premium, $1 over, and you will pay more in Medicare premium. So you have to be really deliberate about what tax, what accounts do I take money out of so that I don't trigger something like that. Let's say you hadn't collected Social Security yet, but now at age 67 or 70, you are. Well, the taxation on Social Security is incredibly complex if you are in a certain tax uh, level, or I'm sorry, a certain income level. So the highest Social Security can be taxed is 85% of the benefit. It's not an 85% tax rate, it's 85% of the benefit. The lowest is 0%. You can actually have your Social Security tax at zero, but there's a good number of people who could be in that middle area and adding more income can blow up uh, an entire, you know, I don't know how to describe it. It just blows up the entire Social Security tax situation. No, it's it's phantom income is what it is, right. and uh, and you have to think this out. Um, you know, I've I've seen people make the mistake of taking money out, not knowing what was going to happen, right. and next thing you know, they uh, 
paid far more in tax than they'd ever have assumed right because they didn't know that these triggers were right. underneath the uh, the market and uh, but also keep in mind with that medicare thing that it is just a one one time right. uh, adjustment right. as long as your income comes back down as long so as well. uh, sometimes you want to let that medicare go up to get the benefit of right. Roth conversions and so forth, right. uh, you know. So anyway, yeah. Uh, but you're right. You need to understand that the tax laws are full of what I call landmines. Landmines. Yep. Tax landmine bombs that are ready to blow up. And like Graham said, right. sometimes it's just one dollar over a threshold. And Maryland now does that. You know, we we live in the great uh, well, People's Republic of Maryland. Well, that, you don't. I do. Well, you do. I, I mean, you, our company yes. is here, though. For a yes. lot of our clients, they make $150,001, and they're right. going to lose a $1,500 tax credit. Right. I mean, it's just absurd. It's hard to even comprehend how these tax laws came into existence, both federal and state. Right. But anyway. And then, and those are some things that you have a little bit in your control. Age 73 here, you have to take required minimum distributions. Now right. there's a new the new law, Secure Act 2.0, got passed at the end of 2022. So most people who are collecting soon, it's age 73. But if you don't turn 73 or seven, there's a certain age. People are born after 1960. 1960. 1960 and on. 75. 75. 75. So, but know that when that age comes, you are required to take money out of a traditional IRA, pre-tax accounts like a traditional IRA, you're required to take money out, which is another reason that Roth IRAs are so so beneficial because there is no required minimum distribution on a Roth IRA. So again, just factoring in all the tax aspects of that withdrawal plan, really, really important. Equally as important is that health insurance plan. So we talked about Medicare a little bit, but while you're working, you most of the time are on employer plan. If you retire before age 65 and your spouse is still working, you could go on their plan. But if both of you are retired, one of the options is the AC change. And there are, talk about you know tax opportunities, you can go onto the exchange and if you can maneuver your taxes in the right way, you can actually get a lot of that premium paid for through subsidies. After age 65, generally people are going on to Medicare, and there's there's often two two paths people talk about: original Medicare and Medicare Advantage. That topic alone is an entirely you know another uh, webinar. But for all intents and purposes, if you can afford it, generally the best option is orig original Medicare, which gets combined with a Medigap plan and a drug plan. Right, and I just want to emphasize that ACA exchange, you know, that if you're under 65, you need medical insurance, you stop working. Right. If we can control your adjusted gross income to be below like $65,000, right. the most you would pay for a really nice medical plan for you and your spouse is about 300 bucks a month. Yeah, it's a it's definitely something to look at. And we've done this a quite a lot. And, and, and quite to be clear, it's yeah. income. It is not net worth. We've had yeah. clients who are worth millions and millions of dollars who, because they are in, let's say, Roth money, remember that Roth money you pull it out, it doesn't show up as taxable income. So that could actually allow you to qualify for these subsidies and get most or almost all of your, your uh, health insurance pay. Hey, look, I don't like the laws of the government, but if they're going to tell me these are the laws, I'm going to work with them to our client's benefit. You know, yeah, that's our job. It's our job. the law and, and figure out how to how to help the client as best as we can. Right. So next one, long term care insurance. So really at age 50, let's say, maybe even a little earlier, we really tell people to start thinking about long term care. Um, but at age 65, we talked about Medicare, right? At age 75 to 85, those are the years where, you know, a lot of clients or a lot of people might start moving into or needing that long-term care. I was about to say moving into a, a long-term care facility, but that's not always the case. Sometimes people will stay at home. Um, sometimes they will live with family. That's not always the best option, but that's that's another option as well, but it's it's 
when you retire, it's thinking about the long-term care. Even though, again, you're at the top of that mountain, you're ready to travel, you're ready to have fun, you're ready to, you know, re relax a little bit maybe. This is still something that's really important to think about. And there's there's a few ways to really handle this. And one of them, oh, I'm sorry, I, I skipped the slide. So this one here, when we say think about long-term care, uh, I attended a webinar once and they they said something that was really memorable ways to think about long-term care. And it was, who will change your light bulb? Who will take you to get an ice cream cone? And who will you eat lunch with? If you can answer these three questions, then you're in pretty good shape for what that long-term care, that late retirement stage will look like. So the light bulb is, all right, if you're at the house, who's helping you take care of the house, right? So that's about your living. Who will take you to get an ice cream cone? That's about your transportation. If you can't drive or you don't like driving at night or something like that, who's going to take you to get that ice cream cone? And then who will you eat lunch with? There is uh, something that isn't really talked about a whole lot, or may maybe it is, and I just haven't talked about it, is uh, there's an incredible amount of, of loneliness in a lot of older people. So this social aspect of who will you eat lunch with is incredibly important. So you got to think it up. You have to have right. a plan. Right. Like we say, you, everyone needs a long-term care strategy. Right. If you're planning to live to be, you know, 80s, 90s years of age, you need a strategy. A strategy. And there's a couple of ways to, to fund that from a financial standpoint. So there's long-term care insurance, which, like I mentioned earlier, you know, 50 years old is really when you want to start thinking about that or getting a quote. Um, or potentially even a little earlier. You know, 45 to 50 now is the uh, is the age range that you need to be thinking about buying this insurance. Right. We used to say 50 to 55, but the way the companies are getting now, you go much beyond 55, and there's a chance that the doctor put one little thing in your medical records, boom, right. you're, you're out. You're not going to get insurance, or you're going to get it at a hefty cost. Now, what we what we know you should not do is don't go to a long-term care insurance agent and ask them if you need long-term care insurance. We should want to buy it and have somebody force you to buy it. Right. <laughs> and we want to look at this objectively. And there's a few ways to do this. So long-term care insurance is one of them. Something called a continuing care retirement community is another one. So in this area, you think of Edenwald, you think of Broadmead, there's a, there's a lot more across the, the country, but these are facilities that you move in, living independently. And if your level of care is goes up and you need assisted living or skilled nursing, they generally have that on the premises. And financially, you go in something called a type A contract where, yeah, maybe you're paying, you go in independent living, you have to be independent living, and yeah, you might be paying a little bit more per month uh, than you would maybe living at home. But the the benefit is that if you ever need assisted living or skilled nursing, that monthly amount stays about the same. Yep. And that's that's one way to hedge the financial risk. Um, I think you you've got a phrase for continuing care retirement communities, right? It's like going back to. Oh, I uh, what I'm saying is that. You know, people, when they hear that term, Graham, they're thinking of the places that their parents were in, where, you know, there's people running around on walkers and it's depressing. It's and heaven's so waiting room. Heaven's right. waiting room and right. so forth. And I say, no, 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 no. When the baby boomers get ready to start doing this, right. these places are going to be like a cross between a Marriott Resort and a Harvard University. And there's a lot of different types, right? So like even yeah. while even today, that's more of like a high rise you know, it's maybe a little more compact where Broadmead, you know, some of the facilities are a little bit more spaced out. So, you know, one of the big objections to these is people say, oh, I don't want to live, you know, all right next to some people. Right. Yeah. There's a lot of options out there. You look up in Lancaster, there's a place called Willow Valley, right. and you can actually have a beautiful 2,200 square foot house. Right. That's gorgeous. Right. And, uh, and five swimming pools and amphitheaters and golf course and i mean you know that's a that's a 
a preview right. of what's going to happen the, in the future. Different swimming pool for every day of the different week. Different swimming yeah. pool for every day. day of the week. Yeah. And then the last one, of course, is if you're going to self-fund. So, you know, if, if someone says, all right, I've got five, ten million dollars and yeah, I I might need skilled nursing, which could be one hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year. I'll I'll pay for that out of pocket. Um, you've got these three kind of sections here, or, you know, three groupings, right? There's people that say, all right, I've got a, a lot of money that I can self fund. And then there might be people who can't even afford long term care insurance and they don't have a lot of assets to begin with. They might end up going on Medicaid. It's really that middle group that has the biggest you know, decision to make is, all right, I've got two, three million dollars. What do I do? Right. Right. Well, this is, you know, this is a decision that is far more complicated than we're able to. We ought to do another one just right. about the long term care strategy. Right. Because there's no perfect answer. The insurance yeah. is not a perfect answer because right. people are learning that the cost of the insurance has been rising ridiculously right. uh, over the years that they've owned it. Some of the companies have struggled to stay in business, like Genworth, to be, you know, specific. name a specific. The continuing care retirement community is not a perfect answer because you got to be independent when you want to go in yeah. there. Yeah. You can't go to them and say, hey, I'm, my health has really gone downhill right. and I, I need to come into your community so I don't have to go into a full long term right. care facility. Right. And self funding, you just never know what the cost is going to be in the future. Right. And, uh, um, you know, there, there's no perfect answer to this. And often it's a combination. Often, you know, um, we, we don't tell, even for people that get long-term care insurance, we don't tell them, hey, go buy this massive policy that's going to cover you 100%. It's, you know, normally some type of combination of all these. And the free market is coming up with some really cool ideas for the future to help people deal with this, like right. virtual nursing homes, right. where you live in an area of about five miles, square miles, okay? Uh, and what happens is, they have these bases around and you pay them a monthly money and they come to your house and do what they would have done if you were in the facility. So that's just some neat ideas that are happening in the future, but none of it is a perfect solution to the problem. See, when you said virtual nursing homes, I, I thought we were all going to put on some goggles <laughs> and be in the metaverse and we would just live in that. We'd all sit in a seat and just have... have have the uh, new Apple glasses on or something like that. That's so, a great idea, Graham. Yeah, yeah. Oh, maybe, maybe you should create one day. Maybe one you day. should create one. Really well. Yeah. Uh, so number nine, update your estate plan. Most people who are on the cusp of retirement, the last time they did their estate plan is when they had their kids. And they have a guardian, and now their kids are, are grown up. They're in their 20s, 30s. And this is generally outdated, both from a personal circumstance standpoint and that the estate laws have, have often changed. Um, and this is this is important to know that it's it's based on your state. So there's not a national, you know, document you do. Every every document you do is really specific to the state that you live in. So the three documents that are the most common are a last will and testament, which is going to help you decide where your assets go, the financial power of attorney, which is if you are incapacitated. Uh, someone else can make financial decisions on your behalf. And then an advanced directive is both a living will that says, hey, here's what I want to have happen if I can't make my healthcare decisions. You know, follow this guide, the living will. And then the other part of that is the healthcare power of attorney, where you're designating somebody to make healthcare decisions on your behalf. Now, again, this is keeping it very simple. There are a lot of things to, to factor in here. Just one as an example is the last will and testament is actually the third thing that dictates where your assets go. The titling of, of an account or an asset is number one. The beneficiary designations on that are number two. And only then does someone look at the last will and testament and decide where does this asset go if, if you know mom or dad have passed away. And then you also have revocable living trust, which some attorneys are right. like you know, they're vehement that you have to do a revocable, revocable living trust. Right. And that's a whole discussion in itself. 
as to when and why you should do that and bring that kind of complexity into your financial planning. So right. this is a good overview of the things you need to be thinking about, but it is, as you say, far more complex than just in these three documents. Indeed. And last but not least are the non-financial aspects. And there's a lot more than these three, but a lot of people retire and they just feel like they're they're expected to retire. And they or they're burned out or they're or they're burned out. Um, but you know, you're no longer going to a job that maybe you actually enjoyed and it gave you purpose. You had relationships with coworkers there, you had an identity. You know, a lot of that goes, it's very different once you stop working. Um, the health aspect of this as well, you can have all the savings in the world, but if you don't have your health. You know, can you do that travel? Can you spend time with the grandkids? Can you, you know, do do what you want that you really envisioned in retirement? So thinking about your health is is another important thing. And then this is um, uh, another one. A lot of people don't really realize that when you both retire, if you both, you know, both spouses were were working, you're going to be spending a lot more time together than what you ever have, arguably, in your entire life. So thinking about, you know, what does that look like? And it all plays in health, purpose, spouse, you know, they're all interconnected there. And like I said, there's a lot more than this. The important thing is you're really thinking about that non-financial aspect of retirement. Yeah, my uh, mother to this day, my father retired, gosh, like 15 years ago. And my mother to this day still says that the first week he retired, he said to me, what's for lunch? And I said, well, there's the refrigerator. I'm going out, you know, and so you're right. It's, uh, but did he have cereal? I have did no idea what he ended okay. up eating, you know, I didn't get the rest Maybe of Maybe a story. peanut butter and jelly was in a while, right? <laughs> but, um, you know, like me personally, I have no desire to retire. I have no wish to retire. I love what I do. I, I enjoy it every day. I couldn't imagine, you know, thinking about, you know, playing golf or fishing. I love those things, right. but I love them because I work, you know, they're, they're treats that I get because right. of the things that I do. And there's a lot of studies now, Grim, that are saying that people who work longer are far happier and healthier right. throughout retirement. Now, that's right. not always true, of course, right? Um, but there's a lot of, a lot of evidence to that. And there's a lot of history of people now working longer and longer. Right. And I love that one uh, company that came out and said, practice retirement. Right. So in other words, don't just cold turkey retire, right. go in and see if your company will let you work three days a week right. instead of five days a week. And then you kind of get you know, and say, okay, you know, I, I still have more time that I want to do other things. Then you right. go in and say, okay, let's go down to two days a week, right. you know? Right. And and you kind of ease into it instead of just cold turkey. And that's if your company allow you to. So. Well, and, that, and, and if so, I mean, it works out generally great from a financial aspect in addition to that non-financial yeah. aspect. Of but it. the purpose is also critical. You yes. have to, you, can, you can't retire from something, you have to retire to something. Right. You need to have a purpose as to what am, what is the purpose that I'm retiring for? Is it because you are burned out? Well, then I think that's a great purpose to right. get get away and get your head clear and think right. about what you're what you've been doing, et cetera. But what's your what's your purpose? Maybe it is grandchildren. If it is, that's great. You know, then you've got a purpose that you're. But make sure your kids are on board with well, that. And, and in reality, you know, because I'm I'm in this the stage is that the kids end up going to school. Right? Yeah, to so school. it's not like that's a that's a full time thing, especially for a grandchild. And I, you, you know, there's a lot of yeah, a lot of dynamics. A lot of things. Your parents may, may watch this, so don't go any further. Right, right, right. right. <laughs> now, so there's a really really good uh, TED talk out there um, by a guy named Riley Moynes. And it is called the four phases of retirement. And he really goes into a lot of what we're talking about. But the the overarching thing he says that the most successful retirees have um, is is that purpose. purpose. And a lot of times, not not all, but almost every time, it's actually about serving other people. Yeah, I say it all the time that life is about relationships and the right. power of relationships. It's not about the amount of money you have. 
It's not about the fun that you can have, et cetera, et cetera. It's about the relationships. Right. And if you think about what most people do in retirement, they do things that bring them in contact with other people, whether it's travel or playing golf or bridge or whatever you're doing, you're typically bringing relationships in, but you want deeper relationships, not just surface relationships. And that's right. very important, right? It is. It is. So those are the, the 10 things we've covered today. There's a lot more I know that that really we would want to cover with anybody individually. Um, but if you have a question on anything we've covered today, if you're already a client, reach out to your primary advisor. If you're interested in becoming one or you, you, know, you want to pass this along to somebody that you think would be interested, you can go, they can go to our website, financialconsulate.com, or there's this fancy QR code. You just take your phone out basically have your picture up to it and it'll take you to the schedule a meeting if you want to. But again, uh, reach out if you're already a client and if you aren't one, feel free to visit the website. I look forward to it. Great presentation, Graham. Thank you very much. Thank you. And this is Drew Tignanelli saying God bless. <laughs>